Hammer guitars go way back to the 70s. 1973 to be exact is the year in which Paul Hammer and Joe Dancing, no, not that dancing, another one, founded the company in Illinois, USA. These guys had the most badass names. Imagine being called Hammer, that's so cool. Gibson and Fender were not having a good time back in the 70s. Both companies had new owners which resulted in some issues in the production. Professional musicians were complaining about the quality of the big boy guitars. What do you do if the guitars sold at the shops are not as good anymore? You start looking at the second hand market, of course. Used Gibsons made in the 50s and 60s were still expensive though. Hammer and Dancing saw an opportunity opening, offering high quality guitars at a reasonable price. Handmade instruments that most players will be able to take on the road and beat the hell out of, not having to worry if they break or got stolen. You open up a business, you need customers. And their first customer was none other than Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. If you don't know who he is, there is a video of his amazing guitar collection uploaded recently by Gibson TV. Be sure to check it out. Rick was a huge fan of Explorer and V-shaped guitars, but no one was making them in the 70s. So the first guitar that Hamer made for him was the standard Explorer, which he still owns. And it's the prototype with serial number 0000. It kinda looks like the guitar that I'm checking out today, but they are quite different. The first Hammer Explorer didn't have the same angle of the pots for example, they were straight, not slanted. Hammer didn't know how to make them slanted. It didn't have neck binding as well. The neck joint was different and of course it was handmade, which makes a huge difference. Hammer has produced some crazy guitars for Rick over the years. Multiple neck guitars, all sorts of crazy shapes, but he's mostly known for his checkerboard pattern explorers and V guitars. In 1988, Hammer was acquired by Cayman Music Corporation and continued producing some guitars until 2008 when it was bought by the Fender Music Instrument Corporation. The guitars were still good even though they were not handmade anymore. They were made in the Indonesian and Chinese factories and not from mahogany but from Corina and Agatis. But things started going downhill. The year was 2013 and apparently Fender did not want to concentrate on making Hammer guitars anymore. Everybody thought this is it, this is the end of Hammer. But you've seen the name of this video, so what happened in 2017? Hammer was purchased by a Canadian corporation named Jam Industries in 2017 as a part of a package deal. It was a big surprise that Hammer attended the yearly 2017 NAMM show. The guitars were produced at the Indonesian Chord Factory where a lot of affordable guitars are made these days. Hammer brought the standard Explorer and the Vector Flying V at the show. Everybody liked the guitars presented at the NAMM show. The future was finally looking bright for Hammer guitars. But after just a few months of production, Gibson filed a lawsuit against Hammer, claiming that they infringed trademarks for Explorer and V-shaped guitars. Big surprise, Gibson suing somebody, right? Gibson sued Jam Industries for $1 million, claiming that they infringed trademarks for Explorer body shape design and Flying V body shape design. Gibson's case appears to be that Cayman has previously acquired license to produce no more than 1000 Hammer electric guitars using the Explorer and V shapes, and that those licenses expired in April of 2017. So it appears that the previous owners of Hammer had a licensing agreement to produce Explorer and V shaped guitars but did not renew them. This story made the guitar really appealing to me. I like lawsuit guitars. So let's check out this bad boy. Okay, let's go over the specs. First of all, as I said, it has a flame maple veneer top and it is looking gorgeous. It's a two piece, as you can see. I didn't notice any finish checkings or anything else that looks really bad. And I was actually surprised that they did the binding pretty well. The other pleasant surprise, I was expecting a China made hardware, but it isn't. It is made in Korea. It has a metric tailpiece and a bridge, two pneumatic, which is screwdriver adjustable. You can see that I've put some masking tape because the owner likes the factory setup and I'm gonna try to keep it this way. Nothing surprising with the controls layout. You got two separate volumes for the two pickups and you got a master tone three-way toggle switch which is the one thing that I would replace in this guitar it's pretty bad the pickup rings come in this beautiful cream color that matches the binding 
and they are slanted. Okay, removing the pickups. First surprise, I did not expect the cavities to be painted with a shielding paint. Both of them. And for the first time, I am seeing pickups made by this brand. GMB pickups are made in Korea and they make pickups for most of the big brands like Schecter, PRS, Gretsch, maybe even Epiphone. Correct me on this, guys, I'm not sure. Since the cavities are painted, I'm not able to see the maple cup, but you can kind of see where the neck connects. And if you're really picky, one of the few defects I found on this guitar, here on the binding of the neck, you can see there's a slight piece left. They should chisel this away. You know, as a Gibson fan, I am really angry to see that the guitar at this price point does a better job than most Gibsons. Even custom shop Gibsons, look at that. The fret edges, they don't scratch. The binding doesn't have instrument marks. The guys at the Indonesian factory did an amazing job. Some small holes on the edges of the inlays, but nothing too shocking. It's, it's decent, it looks good. The standard has a graphite nut and this one seems to be really, really high. And it's one of the things that I would immediately change. The thrust rod cover on this thing is huge. It reaches the A string. Here you can see the hole for it. It is a regular Allen key, four millimeter. It fits perfectly. I know that the headstock should be similar to the Gibson one, but to me it looks shorter and a bit fatter right here. I'm loving this logo, look at this. At a certain light, it just pops. Nothing too fancy for the tuners. The nut measures at around 42 millimeters. And 51.40 at the 12th fret. The neck thickness measures in at around 20.4 at the 1st fret. And around 21 at the 12th fret. Here you can see the neck profile on the 1st and the 12th frets. Looks like a D-shaped neck to me. Feels really comfortable, slim. Let's check out the back on that thing. You can see the mahogany over here. Beautiful. It is a four-piece mahogany. Let's go to the electronics cavities. At first, while trying to disassemble this guitar, I was like, oh man, they cut these wrong. I was having a really hard time pulling them out. But there's a good reason for that. Turns out they're shielded from the factory. And look at that. Shielding paint inside. They even shielded this little thing. Nothing too unusual in the electronics compartment. As you can see, they have these mini Alpha 500K pots. This seems to be cheap, but it's not a problem. It's an easy fix to replace it. And when we opened it, it was actually pretty neat. These were packed together. Three-way switch cavity is also shielded, but they've used this cheap three-way switch, which is normal. They have to cut some costs. This is a cheap guitar, keep in mind. Measuring the pickups. First the bridge, around 16. It's a really hot pickup. Just the Five in the middle position and around 7.7 .7 at the neck position. Original strap button on the back and one on the neck joint, which is normal for an Explorer type of guitar. Some of my friends have replaced them. They put them over here for better balance, but this is a matter of personal preference. I don't like drilling my guitars, but that's just me. It's a regular set neck joint. It's not too high, it's good, but I have some complaints from a friend of mine that says that the access to the higher frets is difficult due to this joint. I personally don't touch those frets, so it's okay for me. Here you can see the scarf joint, if you look closely. The hammer branded tuners chrome and here we have the serial number made in Indonesia 
Some finishing touches before putting fresh strings on this guitar. It's a brand new guitar, but it's a 2017 year model and it has been sitting at the shop, probably being tested by potential customers, so I had to polish the frets. The rosewood fingerboard was dying of thirst, so I applied some oil and immediately started looking darker and better. As I started putting on new strings, I noticed that the tuner washers were not properly tightened. They were very loose, so I took care of that. I had some issues while putting the guitar back together. <laughs> it was not smooth sailing at all. For example, the holes for the bridge pickup screws had been drilled a bit crooked, so reinstalling the pickup ring was a bit hard. I messed up two of the screws while doing so, I got really angry. I also noticed that the bridge pickup is sitting slightly slanted to the side, and this is probably because of bad adjustment springs. No intonation and setup this time, because the nut is probably going to get replaced anyway, so it will need new setup. Let's hear how the standard sounds. So, what do I think about this guitar after having the pleasure of testing it? Well, I think that you can easily forget that this is a cheap $500 guitar. It is really, really well made for the price. Would I prefer a Hammer over a Gibson? Probably not. Would I choose one over an Epiphone? Yes. It needs a new nut, proper setup and intonation, a new toggle switch and a replacement output jack. But after you do that, you got yourself a great guitar for the money. The Hammer Standard was a pleasant surprise. I really like testing this guitar. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you again soon with another guitar.